Hi, everybody. This is Jason Key at SB Grid. Thanks for joining our uh, webinar today. Today, we've got uh, Matt Jarenko, who's joining us from Cold Spring Harbor. He's going to tell us about uncovering dynamic states of the human origin recognition complex. So uh, go ahead and share your slides. OK. Yeah, it looks good. OK. All right. Just uh, before we start, if you've got questions, you can send them to me by chat or any of the co-hosts. Uh, and we'll we'll um, pass those on to Matt at the end. We'll have time to unmute also if you want to ask your question directly. Uh, go right ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Matt. I work in uh, Limor Joshua Tours Lab at uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And uh, one of the uh, things we do in the lab is we look at the uh, replication initiation in uh, humans. Uh, specifically, we study... Um, uh, the human origin recognition complex. And uh, I'm looking forward to showing you some new data we've, uh, some new work that we've done in, in, in looking at this complex and some interesting dynamics. Uh, but before I go into uh, this complex, I just wanna bring to your attention a uh, difficult task of our cells, and that's uh, replicating uh, tightly packed DNA. So how does our cells do this? Um, in our cells, if you extended all the DNA out, it would extend to about three feet. It's a massive size compared to the size of, of the nucleus in the cell. Uh, so the cells pack this into chromatin fiber into, um, uh, and into uh, nucleosomes. Let's see what term laser here. Okay. Um, so this, is, this allows it to pack into the nucleus but then the question is, how do, how do our cells replicate this DNA after it's been tightly packed in here? It's hard to access some of this DNA to replicate. Um, so there's many um, factors involved in this. And one of the, one essential factor involved in, in efficiently um, replicating this DNA is the origin recognition complex, uh, which is involved in this process called DNA origin uh, selection. So essentially what it does is, is mark sites along DNA uh, to recruit uh, factors that will open up the DNA and allow for replication at these sites. So to, to efficiently and organize this uh, dynamic and complicated process, uh, work is essential. Uh, to uh, examples of this is uh, mutations in this complex are associated with uh, developmental disorders such as Meyer-Gorlin syndrome. Uh, the developmental disorders uh, phenotypes are microtia, emphysema, dysplasia of a lot of uh, organs and areas of the body. So general uh, um, developmental disorder um, acro generally across the body. So work is pretty really essential for um, this process of organizing this replication in our cells so they can replicate and divide. Uh, if we go into a little further detail in this process of DNA origin selection, uh, or binds to DNA. Now this is uh, uh, somewhat a mystery in higher eukaryotes where it specifically binds, uh, but it has been shown to be influenced by nucleosome positions. That's why we have this nucleosome here. Uh, after it binds to a site, it recruits uh, CDC6 to complete the ring of the complex. Um, and then from there, it recruits and orients the MCM helicase. That then recruits a second uh, helicase to form this double hexamer complex. This is when ORC exits and uh, the helicase can open up the DNA, allow for the replication machinery to come in and uh, replicate the DNA. So eventually cell division. Uh, a lot of these steps have been um, uh, investigated over the years. So I just wanna give you a brief uh, history of ORC uh, from a structural biology standpoint. Uh, going all the way back to 1992, when the complex was discovered uh, in yeast. Uh, this was actually discovered here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory by uh, Dr. Bruce Stillman, who we collaborate with. Uh, and through the 90s, uh, this, the ORC subunits were further discovered in humans and other species to show it's a prevalent uh, complex 
among eukaryotes. Eventually in 2001, the human orc was isolated, um, uh, completely isolated and assembled. Uh, so we can study this in vitro. I show a uh, moth here, this is a SF9. It's uh, used, an ovarian cell in this uh, species is used for an expression system that works very well, if you aren't familiar with it, uh, for complicated, complex proteins, such as work. So this is an important step as, um, so we could then start to structurally investigate the complex. Yeast expression was getting better too. So uh, after that, we started seeing some early cryo electron microscopy studies on ORC. Uh, these are some interesting 2D classes of the complex that showed some, some features and potential locations of domains. Uh, and then in 2015, the first atomic resolution structure of ORC was determined. And since then, uh, there's been emerging uh, or structures. Um, coincidentally, the first structure was solved by X-ray crystallography. But since then, uh, the more popular technique to look at this complex uh, has been cryo-EM. And I'll, I'll show you it's uh, likely because it's how dynamic the, the, the complex is. Um, the increase in the improvement in cryo-EM with ORC has kind of run parallel with the the resolution revolution in cryo-EM itself. So um, early cryo-EM maps of ORC uh, were a uh, blobology, and then they proved over the years from 2012 to 2018, where now you can take these really high, you have these really high quality maps, we can start to model in um, subunits all the way down to the residues and side chains uh, and get uh, uh, very accurate maps. So uh, if we look at the ORC architecture, it, uh, it consists of six subunits. Subunits one, uh, sub subunits one through five are in, make the partial ring, where in the core here is where DNA uh, binds. ORC six uh, isn't a part of the partial ring, but it sits on ORC three, and it's known to be important in um, orienting the MCM helicase onto DNA. Uh, a good paper from uh, Costa's lab at the Crick Institute um, showed, has a great structure on this in yeast. Uh, so each of these subunits generally consists of these domains, a AAA plus domain and a wing helix domain. AAA plus domain is an ATPase, uh, so it can use an ATP site. This is ORC1. ORC1, 4, and ORC5 are essentially the same, while ORC2 and 3 slightly diverge, but they have Ricci like folds and uh, a wing helix. Um, our lab um, works on the human ORC, and uh, we've done some studies to look at the ATP activity of the complex. So ORC has three ATP sites between ORC1 and 4, between ORC4 and 5, and between ORC3 three, uh, three and 5. Uh, but only one of these uh, ATPs is active. This is the ORC1 and 4 site. You can see here we did, our lab's done mutations at this in the Walker B, aspartic acid um, in the ATP site for each of the subunits. And you can see when you mutate the ORC1 site, you can see completely diminished, uh, the ATP hydrolysis is, is lost. In addition, uh, while well, the other ones, you can see there's not, there's really no loss in hydrolysis. In addition, uh, the myrogorlin mutations are located, uh, two of the myrogorlin mutations are located at this ORC14 interface at R720 uh, and, and tyrosine 174 are the residues that mutate. And when these are mutated, the ATP hydrolysis is also significantly diminished. As you can he see here with the tyrosine 174, uh, uh, C, cysteine is, there's a 50% or so drop. And then the arginine 720Q is uh, completely abolished similar to the Walker B mutant. So a very important site here, the ORC-1-4 site, important for um, uh, 
there are some interesting aspects at this site that uh, are still under investigation. I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, in addition, our lab solved the uh, human orc structure uh, using X-ray crystallography and electron microscopy. They, uh, we determined structures of the orc two and three, orc one, four, and five, and these were fit into an electron uh, density map, cryovian map, and um, of, of slightly low resolution. So I. Uh, recently joined the lab after this paper was published. And uh, one, uh, a task was to, to further improve on the quality of this um, structure through cryo-EM. Uh, this structure, cryo-EM structure was uh, done off-site. Uh, so a lot of optimi optimization in our lab, uh, we, we didn't have the possibility to optimize, more difficult to optimize, I guess you could say. Uh, so I was tasked with improving on this. And at the same time, when I joined the lab, we are, our institute acquired a Titan Krios. Here's the Titan Krios where um, I work with Ken on this project. And Dennis Thomas is our facility manager who has um, uh, been very helpful throughout uh, working on this project. So this is a big game changer for us. We were able to uh, really optimize sample preparation we have a uh, uh, like an vitrobot uh, that we can uh, test on and vitrify on and uh, it really uh, allowed us to really optimize things uh, we did some cloning to change the construct a bit but i'm not going to go into that um, i'm just going to jump right into the uh, the cryo and processing uh, on our successful samples uh, one of the samples was this orc one through five um, which contains uh, everything basically full length except the ORC1. And uh, this was a pretty large data set. We, we collected uh, about five, 6,000 micrographs and uh, picked about 2 million particles. Uh, you can probably, hard to see here, but uh, we utilize uh, BoxNet, which is implemented in in um, warp, uh, and we basically use warp for our real-time processing, uh, and it's been very useful for us. Uh, and you can see from the 2D classes that they're, they're pretty good quality, uh, several different orientations, and uh, uh, a nice Avenicio. So we did the 2D classification and Avenicio uh, um, generation in CryoSpark. And then essentially from there, we take this template and the all the particles and do 3D classification and refinement and rely on. And what we found uh, from this from this data set were uh, four different confirmations. Uh, so somewhat surprised, um, considering that we uh, chemically we see pretty homogeneous sample. And this is somewhat the power of, of cryo-EM where we can do this sort of in silico purification to sift out different confirmations of a complex. So in total, uh, we had two samples, one uh, ORC without ORC1 and ORC uh, with ORC1. One. one thing to point out is this ORC two through five is a very stable complex and uh, no other confirmations were, were seen in this, in this data set, um, where this, this domain right here is ORC2 wing helix, really buried deep into the complex, even more so than this other confirmation that uh, I'll go into. Uh, but once ORC1 is present, the complex really opens up uh, to breathe and, and generates all these confirmations. Uh, so I'll go, I'm going to go into each of these uh, maps and explain what they kind of show. Uh, but first, I just the resolution was was uh, really nice for this uh, map and, and and these three maps. I'll just show you the the densities around the ATPs of this uh, one one map, and they're really nice. The ATP sites were. The best, the best resolution was in the ATP site. So that was good and allowed us to improve on our structure previously. 
Um, but I want to go more into the dynamic aspects of this complex and the different conformations, because I think they're more interesting in this case. Um, so to start out, um, I want to point out the, the opening of this partial ring, or, or the ORC1 and ORC2 are, uh, because there were two conformations, a conformation where the ORC1 AAA plus domain was dynamic and unresolved, so there, but just not, not resolved by cryo-EM. And vice versa is the confirmation where ORC2 wing helix domain is dynamic and unresolved. So these two confirmations seem to, these two domains seem to repel each other. Uh, if one was in a locked position, the other uh, domain was seemed to be dynamic. Um, but we wanted to also look at the dynamic regions and see what, what they were doing. So uh, it, it may be counterintuitive, but we had these higher resolution structures and we low pass filter them to, to look at that dynamic region. So you can see here in this case, where you can't see the ORC1 AAA plus, when we low pass filter, you can start to see density there. And then we can further clean this up by doing a 3D classification at this lower resolution. And you can see uh, different movements. Now I'll show you these uh, uh, different positions. I'll show you these uh, maps more so you can see what is actually happening here. We have this one uh, map where the orc two wing helix, which is dynamic. It seems to be dynamic within one position. On the other hand, you have this uh, other map where the orc one AAA plus domain is dynamic, but also moving uh, drastically between different positions. Now we found this uh, map in this movement quite interesting, uh, considering the precedence uh, in the field of uh, orc field uh, structurally, where uh, previously two confirmations were known. One in this kind of canonical state where the orc 1 4 uh, complexes are forming this interface where ATP is bound. Sorry, you can't really see it here, but the orc 1 is forming that interface. And then another complex, another confirmation where the orc 1 is drastic, the orc 1 triple plus to me is drastically shifted to the other side of the complex. And the ORC2 wing helix domain is buried into the core. So essentially blocking that DNA binding site. And that was termed the auto inhibited state. So that was seen in Drosophila. And uh, this was this canonical state was seen in humans and yeast. So our map seemed to show this ORC1 AAA plus uh, dynamically moving near both of these conformations. And furthermore, when you look at the uh, or two wing helix, it is also buried in this structure where the ORC1 AAA plus domain is moving dynamically. And you compare the, the auto, -inhibited state, auto inhibited state of the fruit fly and, and humans, you can see the, the conformations are, are very similar. So it seems we see the auto inhibited state in humans also, and it seems this confirmation is prevalent uh, more prevalent in, in eukaryotes. Um, it's interesting, to, it'll be interesting to see where this plays a role biologically. Uh, so that's to be continued. Um, in addition, uh, we notice a map uh, of ORC in, in an open confirmation. Uh, when you align this map with one of the previous uh, maps I just showed you, you can see that the ORC 1, 4, and 5 subunits are very well aligned, while the ORC2 and 3 uh, subunits are, are, are misaligned. They're definitely um, out, of, out, out of alignment. So from here, we kind of real, felt, you know, there, there must be some kind of hinge at the ORC3-5 interface uh, that is allowing this ORC2 and 3 or, or allowing these, these separate bodies of the complex to, to move independently of each other. So we wanted to kind of investigate this movement uh, and we uh, went ahead and utilized uh, multi-body refinement in Relyon, which basically you put mask around these different bodies. It uses principal component analysis to see how these bodies move independently of each other and uh, while considering they're, they're connected at this hinge. Um, and the results from the multi-body refinement is uh, you get a bar graph like this showing the 10 most prominent movements 
two of the movements were uh, uh, significantly more uh, prominent than the rest. So I'm just showing those here. Uh, one is this twist motion. Complex is kind of twisting and another is a pinch motion. So hence the title of, of my talk. So any of these motions, so there's definitely this kind of hinge here and any of these motions could, could assist this complex. It gives it flexibility to either bind to DNA, translocate along DNA, or uh, assisting in these somewhat dynamic events such as recruiting MCM or CDC6 um, to uh, perform the initiate DNA replication initiation. So when we when we submitted this um, for publication, uh, a reviewer came back and said, "Well, how do you know for sure that this is um, this movement is actually occurring here? Did you put the mass in the right locations? Can you try masking different locations to kind of confirm that this is the spot?" And you know, it's like, oh, "Okay, well." So we can give that a try, but then we were thinking, well, why not? Why not give CryoSpark 3D variability a shot? Um, considering you don't have to, you, you don't provide any maps, and you just unbiasedly let the let the um, program decide the movement. So, uh, luckily to us, for us, it it showed the exact same movements as the multi-body refinement. The first most prominent movement was the twist. And in uh, the second movement was the pinch. So, uh, so any advice if, if you're looking at movement in your complex, maybe try the 3D variability first. Um, so you don't have to get any, put any bias into it. Uh, I do like how the maps look a little better relying, even, even though this has been, I think the relying maps looked a little better, but basically I always start out with the 3D variability um, because you could just shoot it through and see and, and see where the movement is without giving any input in the positions. Okay, so, and, and in addition, this movement also allowed us to improve the map quality on the edge. Also kind of validating where we put the maps. Uh, in a global refinement, I think the center of mass was on the ORC one, four, and five subunits. So those aligned well, but because of the independent movement of the ORC three and two, the edges were of, of low quality. So after the focus refinement or a multiple refinement, these regions became much clearer and much easier to model in to give us a more accurate structure. Uh, okay, so then the, the last model we saw, or last, excuse me, the last confirmation we noticed, uh, surprisingly, was the confirmation with DNA abound. Now we didn't supply any DNA to our to our sample. This DNA came endogenously from the SF9 expression. Uh, we, we noticed some DNA when we, um, on an agarose gel after uh, purifying out the complex. And when we started processing, we noticed a strong density in the core of the complex. And then finally, in the, in the final map, we saw this density in the core. Now, unfortunately, it seems like the DNA is binding loosely, and, and we definitely run some classes and show it's binding in different conformations. Uh, in addition, it's likely different sequences since uh, human work doesn't have uh, sequence specificity. Uh, so we can't say much about the DNA sequence in, in this structure, but we can look at some of the subunits that are in close proximity to the DNA. Uh, and, and see which ones make uh, have the closest contacts. So overall, uh, all the, all the uh, subunits have uh, some close proximity, some regions have close proximity, including the uh, uh, RECA, the wing helix uh, of different subunits. But the two uh, subunits were the closest were the ORC1 uh, RECA fold, uh, the ISM and the B loop regions were uh, in close contact. These have positively charged residues that would presumably interact with neg negatively charged DNA. And then uh, the orc 2 wing helix domain, which was had some density close to the DNA. The, it seemed it had a little flexibility, the orc 2 wing helix, 
but there were clear densities showing um, it kind of clenched down on the DNA. So these two domains, the ORC1 AAA plus and the ORC2 in helix, which generally repel each other with no DNA present, with DNA presence, they both kind of come, uh, you know, are, are attracted to the DNA, kind of clenching down on the DNA. Not obviously not uh, too uh, clenching too hard because it does the DNA does seem to be quite loose in there. Um, so looking at these these positively charged residues on ORC one, you can see there's some conservation at least in the higher eukaryotes. Uh, as soon as you get to, uh, at least for the ISM, as soon as you get to Drosophila, uh, this, there starts to be some divergence of, of these positively charged residues. On the B loop, uh, some of these positively charged residues are conserved all the way down into yeast, but there is some, um, some divergence in some of the other residues. So maybe this region plays different roles as you go into uh, single cell uh, eukaryotes. Uh, further investigation is needed to look at that. Uh, and another important and interesting region is uh, the ORC4 beta hairpin loop. We were able to uh, generate structure for this region. And uh, that's important because uh, in yeast, this beta beta 4 hairpin loop contains this alpha helical insertion, which bears deep into the major groove of the DNA. So yeast is sequence specific and it binds to the aut autonomously replicating sequence. Uh, and this is a feature that definitely provides some uh, uh, sequence specificity to, to the complex. Uh, in our structure, um, this beta hairpin loop doesn't contain this alpha helical insertion. So there's definitely uh, less of an interaction with the DNA here. And in humans, uh, we know that there is no sequence specificity. So it's kind of a mystery where it binds, or at least it isn't associated with the DNA sequence. Uh, so when you overlay these two, you can see how much further the yeast beta hairpin loop protrudes and, and would bind into this major group. So this is probably a feature that's important that to yeast providing some sequence specificity. So uh, an interesting uh, find, and it could be interesting to further investigate this. Um, if we look at this by uh, the, the uh, sequence alignment of this region, you can see that in, in higher eukaryotes, this it's, it's truncated like humans. Uh, well, as you start getting closer to the single cell uh, eukaryotes, you, you have this extended area, but there still isn't much con uh, conversion uh, in, in the sequence. Uh, so it'd be interesting to check how uh, how this looks in other species. Okay, so I gave you kind of a, um, I went through all the confirmations and I just want to give you a movie just to summarize uh, um, all of them to kind of give you a better inside of what, what we see. Uh, and I'm going to start with the ORC 2 through 5 complex. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a very stable complex uh, through expression and, and purification and pretty much pretty, pretty inert uh, until it binds to ORC 1, uh, considering it, we didn't, it was very clean coming out, out of the insect cell lysate. Uh, so we presume that this is a species that, that sits in the cell, but not really doing much until uh, ORC1 binds. Uh, and the first region to bind of ORC1 is wing helix to the complex. Once it binds, uh, you definitely have, um, start the, a complex starts to open up. You have this ORC2 wing helix domain, which goes from this really tight binding location into this auto-inhibited conformation. And uh, that can now let the, the hinge start to open and close a bit um, and for the complex to start to become more dynamic. Uh, keep in mind that ORC1 AAA plus domain is, is present here. And, it, you know, I show the ORC1 coming into binding to the, this, the rest of the complex, but ORC1 has a lot of binders. So likely the ORC2 through 5 comes in and binds to ORC1. Uh, but when this... This ORC1, this ORC1 AAA plus domain is likely moving between uh, different locations, not necessarily binding first to the ORC4 site. 
it's probably switching over to this auto inhibited state and then uh, dynamically coming back close to the ORC1-4 interface. Uh, keep in mind uh, that the Im important ATP site is here at, at, on ORC1, between the ORC1-4 site, uh, where uh, you have the Meyer Gorlin, uh, uh, res the residues associated with Meyer Gorlin syndrome. Uh, so the only active site, but it's still kind of unclear what the biochemical role and you know biological role is of, of hydrolysis and of the uh, and the movement of the ORC1 AAA plus. So it's uh, interesting. Uh, further, something to to investigate. Uh, but once they really form this tight ATP interface, it can dis displace this ORC2 wing helix domain, which goes into this dynamic state, and then also allowing the uh, you know, the complex to open up, DNA can bind CDC6 and then MCM to go through this uh, DNA replication initiation um, event. Okay, so that's all the, that's the, uh, here's the movie in one slide where you have all the confirmations going from ORC2 uh, through five complex, once ORC1 binds, you have a uh, dynamic movement and opening of the complex and then eventual binding of the DNA. Um, to kind of tighten these, these uh, ends of the DNA the, uh, of the ring can, can bind us slightly on the DNA. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Lee Moore Joshua Tour for um, allowing me to work on this in our, in our lab and for all her advice and just letting me to giving me the freedom to just kind of pursue different different uh, steps in this this these events. Uh, uh, thank Ken for as we've been working together on this project and and trying to figure out um, different avenues and different things to investigate. Ante set the groundwork for this looking at orc in our lab he started it all off um so uh, uh very thankful to him and then all, the rest of the lab was very very helpful and gave a lot of good advice i thank dr bruce stillman for his um uh suggestions and guidance on everything orc um he has been very uh helpful and beneficial and uh dr uh dennis thomas for his help at the microscope. And yeah, a lot of other people to thank. So at Cold Spring Harbor, we have uh, workshops, national workshops. And one of them is a cryo -AM workshop. It's headed by Gabe Lander. Um, and man, they've, they've been really helpful. Uh, I've bugged Gabe so many times and, and all the other instructors are great. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't here this year, but um, hopefully they could be here next year. But yeah, just a lot of people to thank on this project. and. Um, that's it. I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. That was uh, no really, uh, really interesting and nice talk. I, uh, two questions already by chat. If anyone else has questions, you can send them by chat. You can also do the hand raise, which is one of the, um, I think it's one of the emoticons here. Uh, and I can call on you. Otherwise, you can just send me a question by chat. So one is the, just, a, I think, a technical question about the truncated ORC1, is that um, a purification or a, an expression uh, requirement? You need to use a truncated ORC1? Uh, it is an expression requirement. So uh, yeah, yeah. So the it's known that the N-terminal region of ORC1 is contains like IDR intrinsically disordered region. So it gets really messy once we have that region present. Um, uh, so that's why we, we left it out for that purpose. Yeah. And uh, there's another question from Miranda Lynch, uh, who you can ask your question yourself. Uh, yep. you I've uh, allowed anyone to unmute themselves now. Yep. And I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to ask it as well. If you don't have a microphone or if you're otherwise. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Great. Um, so actually, I think that some of the stuff got addressed a little bit later in the talk, but uh, part of what I was interested in is that that uh, large motion you see involving the hinge, um, does that actually, is that responsible for 
getting the DNA into the core part. I mean, it seems like you've got structures that show you some stuff once the DNA is there. I was just wondering if the dynamics are in fact what's causing or what, um, what's allowing that to happen. And as well, uh, sort of how specific, how high of specificity uh, for DNA regions are, you know, I mean, do, do we know that there's specific sequences that are targeted by this complex? Um, okay, yeah, so for the first question, yeah, we don't have data to show that it uh, would help work to orient itself on to DNA, but we presume that that, would, that hinge does help um, because, you know, in, in the cell, there's no, it, the, when ORC finds a region, a site, it, it's not going to be able to go to the end of the DNA and slide on in. It's going to have to, you know, clinch onto the DNA, whether it, it rolls on into it or not. But I, the hinge likely, I don't know if there's any action, like a, like a motor type thing that allows it to um, bind, but it, at least the flexibility allows it to open up and, and get inside. Uh, so that's what we presume. Uh, second, um, uh, sequence specificity. So the, um, yeah, so in human work, uh, I mentioned there's no sequence specificity. Yeast, yeast there is. There's a specific sequence, uh, HE rich sequence that yeast binds to. Um, but a human, this is some of the mystery. It, it seems that it's sequence independent and likely it's its binding is, is influenced by other factors uh, on chromatin, such as nucleosomes or something like that. So, uh, and you know, there is the, I didn't mention the interminal region, there is a domain that as presumably binds to uh, uh, nucleosomes. So another, re another indication that, that uh, the nucleosomes are important for the positioning. Awesome, thanks. Oh. We have uh, another question from Pete Meyer here in uh, at SP Grid. Uh, thanks, Matt. It was a very interesting talk. I had a question thanks. about your so the the difference in dynamics between ORC two through five versus one through five. I'm, I'm yes yes you're curious about an idea that may not make sense, but if if there's an alternative model where two through five has the same degree of motions but it's just not stable enough in the absence of orc one so that complex falls apart and what you're left with is just the two through five and the one conformation can you say something about how you how you distinguish that model from the one where orc two through five is a rigid conformation and gets flexibility when the additional subunit is added um yeah so you mean how i went about processing the uh, or, or at least purifying out the uh, the conformations in the ORC complex with ORC1? How, you mean how I did that differently? Is that what you're kind of asking? I guess I was kind of asking the, the model of adding it, it when you add ORC1 and then to something that's rigid and then it becomes more flexible, that seemed kind of counterintuitive me, to me. So I was wondering if it was possible that, you know, ORC2 through 5, does actually have those conformations, they're just lost somewhere. Yeah, I mean, these are, yeah, during classification, it's it's more, like, probably in 3D classification is more qualitative than quantitative because there's all these other influences like, you know, air water interface, you know, this is gonna influence how things bind to the air water interface. So it's basically qualitative, but um, we generally sift, you know, look at, um, I'll go down to you know 50,000 particle populations for confirmations, and there was essentially nothing else in that ORC two through five um, through 3D classification. Qual qualitatively, they're just they're, it, it just looked much more stable, and you can see why the uh, at least these extra four confirmations they're all associated with with that ORC1 presence. So when ORC1's present here, it pushes away this ORC2 wing helix domain. When ORC2 wing helix domain is pushed away, you, you have more opening of the hinge. Um, and, uh, and with the release of the ORC2 wing helix, it allows DNA to get in. 
But in this case, with Orc 1 not present, the Orc 2 wing helix domain really buries into the core. And this becomes like that domain isn't even moving anymore. And it's just like a rock. So the Orc 1 just kind of pushes away that Orc 2 wing helix. And that seems to where that dynamic uh, confirmation has come about. Oh, I, that makes a lot of sense. I'm just like, I'm, I'm a crystallographer trying to extrapolate how do I go from EM information to you know biological translations and i got a sense for how to do that for crystals but for cryo em i'm still asking questions about it so 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 am i, so am I. <laughs> we had a question from um dan richmond dan go ahead thanks hey matt so yeah hey, how you doing good uh so i have a purely practical uh, technical question when you're moving between rely on in CryoSpark. Um, at what stage of the data processing were you moving any data over or did you do a CryoSpark pipeline from scratch after doing rely on or vice versa? Um, and, and if you have any, and, and as part of that, if you have any tips or thoughts on, on the sort of interchange of, of data and in between. Yeah. Those. I stay in CryoSpark until I know it's gonna be high resolution basically because I'm comfortable like I guess when you get below four angstroms and three and a half angstroms, I'll switch over to rely on because I, at least I'm comfortable with uh, Beijing polishing and the CTF refinement in rely on. And they've, from my experiment experience, they've been very uh, useful and helpful in terms of improving my resolution and, and actually the quality of the map cleaner. I think I, I again, from my experience, uh, the 3D classification, I feel really, I like the 3D classification better in Reliant. The maps look cleaner. I don't see as much noise when I go up and down the threshold. Uh, but if I don't reach high resolution, I just kind of just take what I got and cross spark and either go back and do biochemistry or come up with some conclusion. Okay. So um, no strong warnings about any... Um file conversion or compatibility things. Um, uh, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's just, that's just experience, I guess. Know your, know the metadata, <laughs> know your star files. Uh, and you, you should be, able, it's always, you can always come across some path issue, but you just gotta know how to look at that star file. <laughs> right. we're using the, troubleshoot. We're using the PyEM scripts to go back and forth. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've used it. Yeah, yeah, I've used yeah. those too. And uh, the versions matter. So, you know, certain versions work with certain versions. And, uh, you know, once you find something that sort of works for you, I think, you know, kind of stick with it until you switch versions again. That's what most people do, I think. But Yeah, I, I heard that uh, CryoSpark is about to release a version um, that fixes a major problem with importing particle stacks from Rely on into CryoSpark. So that, that should help a lot of people. Yeah. Hmm. We had another question from... Uh, so I didn't have a name here, uh, W. Kellyison. So uh, go right ahead. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Hi, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, William Elias and Bill is fine. Um, the question I had was um, on the ORC two through five and the ORC one through six, was that the same purification protocol? Because I noticed there's some higher molecular weight bands in the two through five. And was there any DNA visible in the purification for the two to five? Um, yeah, so we, okay, so the purifications were the same, um, but we sometimes get this um, this up here. I think this, this is just, just the strep purification, not showing the actually after gel filtration, just to clarify. Uh, this is, I don't know if anybody gets this when they use uh, streptactin, but this is just pyruvate carboxylase. It's just a contaminant, which can, its cofactor is streptactin. So, I mean, a streptavidin. So that's why it always, it can come out. But anyways, uh, the same purification method. And no, we, we, we didn't see any, any DNA present in this sample. Okay. Uh, right. This one. All right, thank you. No problem. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I think that wraps up our questions. Any other questions? You can jump in. I don't see any other hands up. And I think uh, 
with that, we can wrap it up. Matt, thank you very much for our talk. And uh, especially, I think you have really nice uh, you know, graphics are really clean and clear. It's really easy to see. I like the Pac-Man chasing the, the, uh, the origin. <laughs> cool, thanks, Jason. Really cool. So uh, Appreciate thank you everybody it. for thank you everybody for joining today and uh, be sure to catch us next week for the last one of 2020. <laughs>